from the most conquered city in history. Jerusalem is a city set on a hill. Scott Ross tours the place where the past comes alive. It was critical to take this hill. And the future will unfold. And Jerusalem will dwell secure. Plus, I couldn't recognize him at all. A horrific accident and an incredible answer to prayer. You're strong, you're a conqueror. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. There's tremendous prophetic significance in what happened in Turkey over the weekend. I'm going to tell you about it, how it relates to the Bible, because I think you'll be interested in that. But all, of course, the headlines today has to do with the killing of the police. This man was looking for cops to kill. And now investigators are trying to find out more about Gavin Long, the former Marine who ambushed police in Baton Rouge on Sunday and murdered three of them. We are learning more about the police officers long shot to death. And now investigators are looking into the possibility that he may have had help. Caitlin Burke has the story. A nation and its police officers on edge once again. Around 8.40 a.m. on Sunday morning, Baton Rouge police responded to a report of a man with a gun dressed in black. Devastating audio of officers walking into an ambush. Officers engaged the subject at that particular time and he ultimately died at the scene. Three officers, Brad Garofola, Montrell Jackson, and Matthew Gerald, all dead. In an emotional Facebook post only days earlier, Jackson wrote about the difficulties he faced being a black man and a police officer. He said, in uniform, I get nasty, hateful looks, and out of uniform, some consider me a threat. He continued, I'm working in these streets, so any protesters, officers, friends, family, or whoever, if you see me and need a hug or want to say a prayer, I got you. Jackson was a 10-year veteran of the Baton Rouge Police Department. Matthew Gerald was a father of two daughters and a veteran who served both with the Marines and the Army in Iraq. Brad Garofola, father of four, served 24 years on the Baton Rouge Police Department. Authorities are now looking for answers. The gunman killed at the scene has been identified as Gavin Long, who launched yesterday's attack on his 29th birthday, an African-American military veteran from Kansas City who served five years in the Marines. He claimed online that revolutions of victims weren't successful through peaceful protests, but only through fighting back and bloodshed. But President Obama took the opposite view on Sunday. We as a nation have to be loud and clear that nothing justifies violence against law enforcement. This comes as Baton Rouge is still reeling from the death of Alton Sterling, the black man who was shot and killed during a struggle with police only two weeks ago. Louisiana State Police Superintendent Mike Edmondson asked for prayers for the city of Baton Rouge. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Well, we've got a nation that's torn apart. We've got to bring racial <coughs> justice. But it's time to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to recognize that we cannot kill police officers. And they're going to have to come up with a strategy to overcome this because they're very vulnerable right now. And we need them out patrolling the streets. When you talk about tight security, they have thousands of security in Cleveland for the Republican convention, even before the uh, shootings in Baton Rouge and the terrorist attack in France. Wendy Griffith has that l report. Thanks, Pat. Amid that tight security, you mentioned the convention opens today with Donald Trump looking to prove to voters that he's worthy of the White House. And in addition to Republican delegates, many Christians also traveled to Cleveland to call out to God on behalf of America. David Brody brings us the story. Here in Cleveland, convention week didn't start out with politics. It started with praise. We stand in your presence, we pray. Thousands of Christians came here to pray for revival in America. The Bible says, if my people who humble themselves and pray, 
seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, there will be a healing and hearing from heaven. Good news for those who understand that only Jesus saves, certainly not any politician. It's not about political parties. It's not about our personal preferences or den denominational preferences. Today, it's all about Jesus. This week, it will be all about Donald Trump. He comes here with one goal, convincing skeptical voters that he's presidential material. Picking Indiana Governor Mike Pence as his running mate seemed to help him on the credibility front, but evangelical leaders say it's going to take more than that. It's going to have to be Donald Trump is going to have to move the constituents. He's going to have to say things that evangelical pro-life Catholic Christians uh, want to go out and work for him and move into the into the marketplace. In the political marketplace, he's being outspent in key battleground states and trailing in others. Facing relatively high negatives with voters, Trump needs to reach minorities, and he's getting help from a key pastor. You have no reason to be afraid. Somebody give God glory right there. Daryl Scott is pastor at Cleveland's New Spirit Revival Center, and he will speak during primetime at the convention later this week. His support for Trump has led to criticism in the African-American community. You get the name calling. Uh, and because they don't know him and they let people accuse him of being racist and different things like that, that he's not. And so, you know, and then if you defend him, you're automatically a sellout or an Uncle Tom. Belinda Scott, his wife and co-pastor, have known Trump for years. She says they've seen him grow spiritually. He really is pursuing a deeper spiritual life. I'm, I, I can sense it. My prayer for Mr. Trump is that he will be more sensitive to God than he's ever been before. Supporter Amarosa, who gained fame on Trump's reality show Celebrity Apprentice, says she's keenly aware of the racial tension in the air and is praying for calm. I call in the name of Jesus because I believe that prayer changes things, but more importantly, prayer changes hearts. And so I believe that we have to rise above partisan politics petty debates and arguments, and we have to unite as the American people. The good news for Donald Trump is that there appears to be no official challenge to his nomination this week here in Cleveland. That means here inside the arena, it should be relatively calm and a controlled situation. Outside the arena, all bets are off. Protests could happen. That means violence could rear its ugly head and we'll be monitoring events all week long. David Brody, CBN News, here in Cleveland, Ohio. And we look forward to that. Thanks, David. Well, Turkish warplanes have been patrolling the skies over Turkey, signaling that leaders believe the threat to the government is not over yet. Turkish President Erdogan has blamed part of the military for trying to take over the country over the weekend. He's been rounding up thousands of men. Nearly 300 people were killed in that coup attempt and more than 1,400 wounded. Turkey accuses an Islamic cleric, Fatullah Gulen, of orchestrating the coup. They want him extradited from the U.S. CBN News reported years ago about, about Gulen's efforts to organize a global Islamic movement from his headquarters in Pennsylvania. And you can find our look at the controversy surrounding him at CBNNews.com. Pat, what's going on? Well, I think here's the deal, uh, Wendy, and I think, ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand. When that coup took place, I said, uh, you know, that goes contrary to prophecy. And uh, I, I don't believe it's going to happen. And indeed, it didn't happen. And it looks like now it may have been staged to set up Erdogan. You see, here's what the Bible says. And I want you to look at very carefully because it, it, it's directly uh, attached to what is going on here in Turkey. Here's, the, here's what Ezekiel said, chapter 38. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the land of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you about, put hooks into your jaws, and bring you out, and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them, splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. Now look at this, this is important. Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them 
all of them with shield and sword, and this is the one that's important, Gomor with all its troops, Togarma from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many people with you, be prepared and prepare yourselves, you and all your companies that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. And then it says in that, that uh, uh, God is going to bring that great group, group of people. But who are those people? Gomer, Gomer is Turkey. Uh, Put is Libya. Uh, Ethiopia is just Ethiopia. Persia is Iran. So the, this is going to be the Caucasus region of the Muslim states in, in the Russian area, along with a great army from Turkey, and the uh, Libyans. And uh, you've got uh, Kush, which is uh, 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 Islamic right now, uh, uh, down uh, uh, in, in the northern part of Africa. So all that's coming together according to the Bible. And Turkey is key. Now, it looks like Erdogan, this whole thing was a, was a, was a setup. He is going, he's purging the military. He's purging the courts. He's putting all kinds of people in jail. And when it's all finished, he is going to be the undisputed dictator of Turkey. And he's going to swing it in the Islamic fashion. It's going to be a radical Islamic state hating Israel. That's what's going to happen. And he will be a key player in a coalition in the last days to come against Israel. That's why this coup sounded good, because they would take it back to democracy, uh, like, um, you know, the early days, it was supposed to be a democratic uh, uh, country. But no, it's going to be a radical Islamic country. And that's what you were looking at. So please believe me, don't be applauding Erdogan. He is going to institute a dictatorial uh, power that we have not seen in a long time. And it's going to be terrible for Israel. Wendy? In other news, recording artists, preachers, and believers from around the country packed the National Mall in Washington, D.C. this past weekend to pray. The Together 2016 event had been in the works for the last five years and was scheduled to last 12 hours. But extreme heat and hundreds of ambulance calls forced the Parks Department to shut it down after just seven hours. Ephraim Graham was there. Saturday temperatures quickly climbed above 90 degrees here in Washington, D.C. But the steamy weather didn't keep hundreds of thousands from answering the call to come to the National Mall, to stand together, worship together, and pray together. This isn't about perfect people gathering. This is about imperfect people. And we're all gathering to seek the perfect one. There's only one answer. It's Jesus. Nick Hall is the man behind this massive event called Together 2016. And recording artists like Hillsong United, Lecrae, and Matthew West lent their voices to the experience. I was overwhelmed by the crowd, just the size of the crowd. There was thousands, hundreds of thousands of people's, people standing in that, uh, that place today celebrating the God who forgives, the God who renews, and the God who can bring healing to our hurting nation. Packing the National Mall with a million people to pray has been in the works for the last five years. But the timing of it, considering what's happened in our world in the last few weeks, couldn't have been more perfect. Unfortunately, extreme heat forced the Parks Department to shut things down about five hours early. That decision came after hundreds had to be treated for heat-related illnesses. I love that we're together. It's good to see a glimpse of what heaven might be like one day. This is just a glimpse, but when it comes down to it, we got it at one point, whether it's at 9 o'clock or now, be ready to walk out of here and live it out. Christian concert organizer Ryan Romeo was there when Minister Nick Hall first announced plans for Together 2016 five years ago. How bummed are you that it had to end early? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's, it's five years of them planning that. Uh, that, was, that was a hard thing, but, you know, I talked to one of the leaders right after and he said, you know, I just got to trust that the Lord had something in that, you know, even with tears in his eyes, he said, I have to trust that God knows what he's doing and that something amazing still happened, even though we had to end it early, you know. Because the true measure of success is what changes after leaving the park. 
Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Washington. Well said. Thanks, Ephraim. Well, the country of Ghana is home to more than 25 million people, with 5 million under the age of 14. It's also home to a brand new center for children sponsored by CBN's Orphan's Promise. These beautiful children I'm standing with are dressed in their very best and filled with excitement because today we cut the ribbon on the Village of Hope. Each one of them has come here needing a family. They'll be in an apartment with a mom and a dad, six children to a home. And there also is a beautiful chapel at the center of this place that includes a library. There's a soccer field I'm looking at, lots of activity for them. And an interesting story here too about a young man named Richard who was actually educated by Orphan's Promise. He majored in agricultural technology and today he is building and running fish farms here on this property that will feed protein to these children and also supply income for the Village of Hope. I also had the privilege of dedicating the chapel with a message taken from Psalm 68. God said, I will put the lonely in families. Why? Because family is a God idea. Children are meant to be raised by moms and dads who love them and help them envision who they are and dream for their futures. And that's why we're here, because in this house, children who have found themselves without that are going to be redeemed by the mercy and the grace and the love of their heavenly father. And we get to watch it. It's going to be an amazing miracle. And our Terry Mewson is just back from Ghana. Terry, what a heartwarming story. How many kids are going to actually be able to call that place home? Well, Wendy, 30 some right now, but there will be eventually as support comes in another building next door. These are actually separate homes, six of them in this first building. There will be six more in the other, about six to seven children to an apartment with a mom and dad. So they're growing up in a family scenario with siblings. And most of all, the Arise Chapel is right at the center of this. They're growing up knowing the love of Jesus Christ. And so we're working with the Village of Hope team and Orphans Promises teaming up with them. Lots of wonderful support coming uh, from friends of that organization. And we love to partner with people who are doing it well. But what was so exciting to us was to find Richard. Here was this young man that we had found in junior high. We've educated him all the way through college. He's got a degree in agricultural technology. And here he is now living there, raising fish to feed the children and as a micro enterprise opportunity to help support the place as well. God redeems on all levels and the kids are beautiful well the people are beautiful we had a wonderful wonderful trip and uh, we've got lots more stories coming up so watch for the Ghana stories yet to come well the heart of the Jewish people is under attack as the so-called peacemakers mull over dividing Jerusalem I think that it would be a disaster of historic proportions Scott Ross gets a history lesson in the city of Kings when we come back Welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club on this first day of this whatever, and it's good to have you with us. When it comes to Israeli-Palestinian peace talks, the idea of dividing Jerusalem is often a deal breaker for the Jewish state. But why is a united Jerusalem so important to Israel? Our Scott Ross took a look to get the answer. Jerusalem's old city, the Temple Mount, and the Mount of Olives all share common bonds. In addition to biblical significance, they're all in the part of the city Palestinians want as their future capital. Scripture says, Jerusalem is a city set on a hill. And we are standing on the hill, the Mount of Olives, and we are overlooking the Temple Mount. Beautiful <clears throat> vision here of the old city and behind it, the new city. Haim Silberstein, founder and president of Keep Jerusalem, believes the city must remain united. We spent a day looking at Jerusalem from different angles to understand its complexity. This is a city that's ensconced in geopolitics, in divisiveness, 
both within the Jewish people and certainly the Arab nations against the Jewish people. Jerusalem has been conquered more than any other city in history, yet it's been the only capital the Jewish people have ever known. Still, the world refuses to recognize it as Israel's capital, even though it's mentioned more than 640 times in the Old Testament and not once by name in the Koran. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. We know that over 3,000 years ago, King David came here, he conquered Jerusalem, and he set up his capital here. And for a thousand years, Israel had sovereignty, the Jews had sovereignty in the land of Israel. A pocket of Jews remained in, in Palestine, in Israel, throughout the centuries. But we only saw a real return of the Jewish people in the last 150 years or so. On the world stage, Jerusalem is typically divided between east and west. The newer western city is primarily Jewish. The older eastern section stretches from north to south. The majority of the city's Arabs live there, but so do an almost equal number of Jewish Israelis. With the city as it is now and the talk of dividing Jerusalem, is that realistic, uh, a divided Jerusalem? I think that it would be a disaster of historic proportions and a huge mistake because dividing up Jerusalem will create the exact opposite effect of peace. From 1949 to 1967, Jerusalem was divided with Jordan controlling the eastern sector. During 1967 Six-Day War, Israel took back control. The Bible calls Jerusalem the city of the great king, and it's seen many kings. In 1964, Jordan's King Hussein started building a hilltop palace on the northern edge of Jerusalem. The Six-Day War interrupted his plans. This site where we are now is not really the palace of King Hussein, but rather the palace of King Saul. From on high, it's easy to see why kings old and new would want to occupy this hill. We're looking eastwards and we're actually looking into the Judean Desert. Behind the Judean Desert are the mountains of Moab, which is where Jordan is today. Oh. So we can see all the way to the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley. What we see below us is the Jewish neighborhood of Pisgat Zeev, and to the north of that, Neve Yaakov. These two neighborhoods are basically nestled within Arab neighborhoods that are surrounding them. If we would cut off Jerusalem and say everything to the left of this line would be Palestine, 90,000 Jews living in these two neighborhoods would find themselves in Palestine. How can you divide them when they're so integrated? That is a rhetorical question. It is? Yes. <laughs> Looking to the north, we could see Biblical Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank. In the distance, just five miles from Jerusalem, is Ramallah the current seat of government for the Palestinian Authority. An important thing to understand when you want to understand the strategic issues facing Jerusalem is what is the goal of the Arabs? They understand that Jerusalem is the heart of the Jewish people and if they can liberate Jerusalem from their point of view, then they will have succeeded in liberating Israel ultimately. Silberstein believes the Arabs have three main ways they're working to liberate Jerusalem by force, propaganda and diplomacy, and demography. What they're doing is building and building and building inside Jerusalem largely illegal structures, in fact have successfully created a territorial continuum that runs from Ramallah in the north all the way through Jerusalem, through the old city, to Bethlehem in the south. And by doing that, they would have infiltrated a demographic Trojan horse inside Jerusalem. Do you have hope for this city to eventually be whole? Do you see a good future ahead or no? Zechariah chapter 14 talks about what's happening here on the Mount of Olives. There'll be an earthquake here, there'll be a war, there'll be all kinds of unnatural things that are happening here. That's yet to happen. That's yet to happen in the future. But Zechariah ends the prophecy by saying, and Jerusalem will dwell secure. The question is, how we will get there. The thing that is guaranteed to bring peace to Jerusalem is keeping Jerusalem united under Israeli sovereignty. And that certainly is the prelude to hopefully the, the uh, 
incredible event that we hope and pray will happen later, which will be ultimate peace, both to Jerusalem and the world. Scott Ross, Jerusalem. Thanks, Scott. The Bible says that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. We're talking about the return of Jesus. I mean, this is a very significant prophetic uh, place. And uh, Jesus said, Jerusalem <clears throat> shall be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. In the Six-Day War, 1967, for the first time in, well, 2,500 years, the Jews had control of Jerusalem. <clears throat> and that meant that something extraordinary is getting ready to happen in the Gentile world. And that exactly is what's happened. We've been chaos and chaos and confusion and wars and uh, earthquakes and famines and all kinds of difficulties and debt uh, cascading and all that has taken place <clears throat> since 1967. Now, to divide that again would go against the Bible. Earlier, I talked about Erwin and, and Turkey. Turkey was going to be part of a coalition to come against Israel. And therefore, you're not going to have a pro-Israel factor taking over Turkey, because the Bible says it's going to be contrary. The Bible says that Jerusalem uh, was underfoot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. From this point on, Jerusalem is not going to be divided. It will not be divided. And to try to divide it, you are going against the Bible. And any <clears throat> leader or any coalition of nations that tries to destroy the biblical foundations will find that they have been destroyed. They'll destroy themselves. And so uh, we're looking at something very, very important. And keep your eyes on Jerusalem. The incredible thing is, the United States Congress voted to move our embassy to Jerusalem. But the State Department refused to go along with what Congress mandated because they said that would upset the Arabs. So they keep it in Tel Aviv, and they try to make believe Tel Aviv is the capital of Israel. It's no such thing. Tel Aviv is an important office. They have the Defense Department in Tel Aviv, et cetera. But it's not the capital. And for the State Department to be blindly following uh, that course is just one more example of why we need a sig significant change in the leadership of our nation. Terry, so much for that. Yeah, well, Amen. lots going on. Good yeah. to keep an eye on that yeah. insight oh, yeah. into Turkey is Amen. fascinating. <laughs> well, coming up, a car crash leaves one pastor in critical condition. They said, I'm sorry, your husband is between life and death. I felt helpless. Watch him make a miraculous recovery when we come back. Raul de la Mata had just finished preaching one Sunday afternoon when he loaded his family into his minivan. He was driving along a strip of road that he called the safest expressway. And then, before he had a chance to react, he heard his wife scream and saw a big black Audi hurling toward his car. Take a look. All he, he could do was turn the wheel. It was just a screeching sound, and it was over. A car lost control, crossed the median, and slammed into a minivan, which was carrying a family of five. In the van were Pastor Raul de la Mata, his wife Elizabeth, and their three children. I was just so disturbed by the sight of my eyes, and the first thing I did was cry out to the Lord for his help. Elizabeth and the younger children had minor injuries, while their teenage daughter suffered some broken bones but would recover. Raul, on the other hand, was airlifted to Loyola Hospital in critical condition. They said, I'm sorry, your husband is between life and death. I felt helpless. Raul suffered multiple fractures in his arm, femur, and pelvis. But the doctor's main concern was keeping him alive. His blood pressure was at critical levels, a sign there was internal bleeding. Dr. Michael Stover was his lead orthopedic surgeon. When you have injuries to your pelvis, especially in a car accident, that's kind of a marker for other organs to be injured. 
After hours of searching, doctors found a vein in his pelvis that had been severed. They stopped the bleeding and waited for him to stabilize. Meanwhile, Elizabeth called on their church to pray. They were praying for life, that he not die, that he live, that he'd be able to walk, that he'd be able to continue preaching. It was hours before Elizabeth was allowed to see her husband, who was in and out of consciousness. I was devastated with the sight that I saw. I couldn't recognize him at all. I held my tears and I wanted to be a strong wife. And I told him, honey, we are all okay. We love you. We're praying for you and you're gonna get through this and you're strong, you're a conqueror. Prayer continued throughout the night. And by morning, Raul had stabilized. Doctors began repairing the fractures and searching for signs of internal damage. Elizabeth remembers getting the news. No internal organs were punctured. When the doctor told me that, he said, it's just broken bones. We can work with broken bones. That for me was very peaceful. And I said, thank you, Lord, because you've heard our prayers. But Raul still faced a long, hard recovery. In the span of seven days, he went through numerous reconstructive surgeries. Afterwards, he woke up and was coherent for the first time since the accident. Dr. Stover came in. All I remember him saying is, you were involved in a very severe car accident and you're not gonna be able to walk for at least two years. It felt like I put all my dreams in a firecracker and they just blew up. Literally, I said, what, what am I gonna do with my life? Not to be able to stand up, not to be able to play with my children, not to be able to play tennis with my son. It felt hopeless. It felt like either the Lord does something or, or, or I, I, that's it, my story's done. Raul, his family, and others prayed as he began rigorous physical therapy. It was such a hard process to see him go through that, but he was very strong and he decided to get better. Raul progressed faster than anyone expected. Then, after only 11 months of therapy, he was back on his feet. From the walker to the crutches, from the crutches to the cane, then from the cane to holding on to someone, and then I was finally able to walk. Not two years as the doctors had said. Today, Raul walks without any issues. And when he and Elizabeth aren't pastoring their church in Illinois, they're traveling the world, sharing their story. It doesn't matter how dark the situation looks, the love and the light of Jesus will pull you through. Cry out to God, our Savior, and He will help us. He will help you, and He will meet you at your situation. There is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved. I hope that speaks to your need, to your life, to whatever you're facing today. God is bigger than your issue, bigger than your health. He's bigger than your finances, bigger than your marriage. Today, we wanna pray for you. And we wanna start by sharing some other reports that have come yeah. in to just encourage and build your faith as well. Pat, this is Cindy who lives in Packwood, Washington. She was lifting a couch when she twisted the wrong way, caused immediate pain in her back. An orthopedic surgeon ordered an MRI and the MRI showed a broken back. Can you imagine that? Oh, man. The surgeon told her it had been too long since the injury occurred and he couldn't do anything. Then one day she was watching this program and Pat, you had this word of knowledge. Somebody has a cracked vertebrae. The coccyx area of your spine has been broken. It's being healed. It will be a miraculous healing. She said, that's me. Later that evening, she realized the pain was gone. She has been pain free since that Praise day. That is a miraculous God. healing. Well, here's another one, Terry. Uh, Jane of Troy, Alabama had a recurring issue with her eyes. Her eyelid would become uh, scratchy and it would swell up like she was uh, having been in a boxing match. Then one day she was watching, and you had this word, there's someone, you have this uh, recurring problem where you get these little uh, blisters under the lids of your eye. Jane said, that's for me, and her eyes began to clear up, and she hasn't had any trouble since. Folks, God is able, 
And we are not worthy of any of this, so it's not our holiness or righteousness. It is the Word of God and the power of God. So Terry and I are going to join together right now. We want to pray for you. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray with my dear sister, in the name of Jesus, Somebody, again, has a broken back. You, you, you've been suffering from this thing. Mm -hmm. They may have even tried to fuse something. And at this point of time, you're going to feel like a bolt of electricity go through you right now, like lightning. In Jesus' name, be made whole. There's somebody named Marty. You're praying about a financial scenario. God's going to answer your prayer. Marty, you be sure you understand who he is, that he's capable of doing that and loves you enough to do it. Somebody's got psoriasis, and it's like blisters and, and superating. It's, it's like, you know, like you've got boils breaking. It's just, I can't just exactly describe, but it's just a, uh, an ooey, oozing mess. And at this point of time, put your hand on that area where it hurts in the name of Jesus. Touch! Someone else with cluster headaches, like migraines, you get them regularly, you have for years, but not after today. Receive your healing from Jesus now. The Lord, others who have been praying, meet their needs, hear their prayers, we pray. Not because of us, Lord, but because of your love. Do it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Call us. Let us know what the Lord has done for you. We love to have these reports. We love to share them. It builds people's faith. Terry. Well, still ahead, we're going to bring it on with questions from you, our viewers. Gilbert says, my friend wants me to store illegal items at my house for her. What do I do? Well, hear Pat's response to that and more when we return. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Prayer vigils were held at a cathedral in Nice Sunday for the victims of the Bastille Day truck attack. Thursday night's massacre left 84 dead and hundreds wounded. Many of the victims were tourists. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the brutal terrorist attack. CBN is using the internet to reach more than 1 billion people in China with the gospel. 7GTV features a variety of new videos every day, including Chinese testimonies, interviews with Chinese Christians, and more. The site is in its third year and is gaining popularity. So far, it has more than 31 million views on Youku, that's the Chinese equivalent of YouTube, and is getting more than 50,000 views a day. So S7GTV is going strong. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, we want to bring it on with some of the email questions that you all have submitted. And Pat, this first one comes from Gilbert, who says, My friend deals with some illegal items, which I presume may be drug or alcohol related. She wants me to keep them in my house for storage. Is it bad for me to allow this? Please help. Well, I'll tell you the way it goes, buddy. Uh, if they find confiscate, I mean, uh, contraband, uh, illegal drugs and so forth in your house, not only will they take them, they also can confiscate everything else you own in your house. Everything. And then they can go after your bank account and all your money. And you may somehow get it back after months and months or years and years of, of legal work. But in the meantime, you will be stripped of everything you have. Get rid of that junk. That, that lady is not your friend. Trust me. Yeah. Could that would that be considered aiding and abetting in any way if he knew they All were? All of it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it depends on on how they want to frame a complaint. But the one thing they've got these enormous powers of confiscation yeah. uh, of, of of contraband, and they can once they have a seizure, they can get everything you've got. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's terrible what yeah. they do. I mean, take your car, you take your money, take your jewelry, take everything. All right. Okay, this is Gigi who says, how can you talk to the Holy Spirit and how do you know the Holy Spirit is talking to you? Well, the Holy Spirit is a still small voice and you have to listen to the Spirit. 
you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk ye in it. It's a still, small voice. But you can talk to the Holy Spirit. I mean, He is a person. He's, and this is God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So you can say, uh, you know, I think Benny Hinn wrote a book called Good Morning, Holy Spirit. I mean, you can, of course you can talk to the Spirit. He is a person. And you can welcome him and say, look, you're honored here in my house. You're honored in this place. We used to sing a song, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And I, I think we need to welcome the Spirit of God and honor the Spirit of God. But obviously the Spirit of God is there to lead us to Jesus, not to exalt himself. That's the way that the, the deal works. So how do you know when the Holy Spirit's talking to you? Well, by reason of use, you get used to the fact you know. I mean, sometimes it's your own voice, sometimes it's the voice of the world, and sometimes it's the voice of God. So you have to practice the presence of God. Mm -hmm. All right. This is Mary who says, My son Thomas brought up a good question. What was the significant reason for the number 40 in the Bible? Well, 40 is, is the length of a generation. Uh, you know, so a generation is 40, and then, but there, there's significant. Ten is the number of completion. Four is the number of earth. Three is the number of the Trinity. So you've got four and three is seven, and you've got a, a numbers around that. But 40 is four times 10, 10 uh, being the number of completion, four being the number of earth. But that's the number of a generation. This is Jackie who says, Hello, Pat. I'm very lost and broken. I would like to know why the Lord takes people and things away from me. Also, how will I know that I'm in the place that God wants me to be? Uh, spend time with the Lord. Spend time reading the Word and let the Holy Spirit minister to you, and He will. And you'll have the sense uh, in your life that you are part of Him. The Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. But listen, You've got a, there's a negative thing in you that, that is driving stuff away. You don't realize what you're doing, but there's something inside of you that feels that you're not worthy to have things, and therefore, when the things come to you that are good, you won't receive them. You need to recognize you are an anointed child of the living God, and that He wants to do good things for you. And so don't resist having good things done to you, and He will do good things for you if you expect it. You need to have an expectant mind and heart. The Bible said, 81 Psalm, open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Okay? Well, that's thank a good you. word for all of Amen. us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for your questions. We love hearing from you, and we'll try to answer some more tomorrow. But up next, a 30-day drug binge ends at an unlikely place. Just getting high and practice sleeping outside, everything. It's, it's hopeless, you know? It's like, am I going to come out of this? Hear how he got his answer right after this. You're watching the 700 Club. So happy to have you with us today. And may the Lord bless you today as in every day. I want to tell you about Martin Lawson. Martin was terrified. You see, for 30 days and 30 nights, Martin had kept getting high with nothing standing in his way. And during that month-long drug binge, he had two thoughts. Number one, how am I going to get more drugs? And number two, am I going to make it out of here alive? Well, I was just out there for 30 days, just nonstop, just getting high and cracked, just sleeping outside, everything. It's like, am I going to come out of this? Can I come out of this? Martin Lawson's addiction ruled his life, and he felt powerless to change. It was the same feeling he had when his dad left him and his mom when he was only five years old. Mom loved me, but she was too busy. But I didn't have anyone in my life telling me who I am, um, instilling a, a sense of purpose in me, um, a sense of identity. Martin's mother did the best she could and even took him to church. But as Martin got older, he became bitter. I was angry at my teachers. I was angry at my dad. I was angry at those who had stuff that we lacked. He got into fights often to prove that he was in control. It made you feel like, okay, yeah, you got to listen to me now. You're wrong. I'm right. Because that was the only way that I could deal with 
certain things that were very real and present in my life. Throughout high school, Martin partied with his friends. But when he came home after his first year in college, things had changed. His friends were in a gang and selling crack cocaine. Before long, Martin joined them. 17, 18 years old, you're, you're making $1,000, $2,000 a week. Money was power, money was influence, uh, money was independence. It was more violence, it was more danger. But at that age, it was also more exciting, you know. But in time, the violence escalated out of control. It wasn't just fighting anymore, it was like, you got beef now, you, you're shooting at somebody or they're shooting at you. One year we lost like 10, 10 people, um, buried like 10 people, yeah, one year. So it was, um, it was, uh, it was rough. Eventually, Martin began smoking crack. At first, it was just because it was there. Later on, it began to be, okay, you know, a means to, to cope. People are dying around you and you're getting arrested and the money's not coming as quick as it, as it used to be, but you're still in the lifestyle and you, 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 you don't see another way out. Martin moved away, hoping to turn his life around. He got a job and stopped using drugs. He even professed his faith in Jesus. But I didn't, I didn't give him my life. I hadn't let go. I hadn't repented. I, I was just, um, I was open, I guess. And I was getting tired and I was getting fed up, but I was still, I was still addicted. Martin returned home and for the next 10 years, lived between stretches of drug binging and soberness. During that time, he began dating a Christian and even went to church on occasion. But he still couldn't shake his addiction, and it was getting worse. I realized that I just didn't like myself. I hated myself. You know, I'd look in the mirror and just like, I couldn't stand the person that I was looking at. Then, hiding out in a boarding house, he went on a binge that lasted for 30 days. Not eating. Nothing, just getting high on crack, just sleeping outside, everything. It's, it's, it's hopeless, you know? It's like, am I gonna come out of this? Can I come out of this? Martin's girlfriend found him and helped him clean up. The next morning, she took him to church. When the pastor finished his sermon, he approached Martin. He came down, he said, I need to pray for you. He laid his hands on me and he prayed. And I was just like, I'm done, you know, I can't do this anymore. And so it was, um, I guess, um, I guess what I felt was God's um, love for me in spite of myself. I mean, I hated myself, but God loved me in spite of my, my disobedience, my, um, my ignorance, you know, all the, the wrong I had done. I guess I felt his grace and his, and his mercy. At that point, I knew the love of God. I knew the love of Christ. And um, it changed my life. Martin finally gave God control of his life. I was set free. I was, I was no longer a slave to not only the addiction to crack cocaine, but to the lifestyles. I was no longer a slave. That was not my default anymore from that point on. Martin admits he had a brief relapse, but he immediately stopped and turned back to God. Today, Martin is married, ordained as a minister, and mentors at-risk youth. Those things that had hindered me before, they don't have that same power. They don't have the power to enslave me, to misguide me, to mislead me. My core cries out. I mean, from the very depth of my being that words can't touch, because they fall short. That's what Christ is to me. That's who Jesus Christ is to me. Words fall short. 
There's nothing like the love of God. You see, you ask yourself, and I'd ask myself, here's Martin. He's beating up people. He's binging on drugs. He's a derelict. He's a danger to himself and society. Why not just throw him aside? You know, he's worthless, isn't he? Not in the eyes of God. God says he's precious. Martin is precious. And God says you are precious. You see, it looked like Martin had sent away his chance at redemption. He was gone. He was shot. He was finished. But God wasn't finished. And suddenly when Martin realized the love of God, that's all it took, he was transformed. If anybody's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all has become new. Do you want that? Martin cried out to the Lord, and the Lord heard, and the Lord answered. Pray these words with me, will you please, right now? Jesus, pray with me, Jesus. I'm a sinner, Lord. I know, Lord, the world would say I'm worthless. But Jesus, I know that you died for me, that you said I'm precious. And so, Lord, I want you, and I turn my life from the sin of my life, and I turn it over to you. Take my life, Lord Jesus, and use me for your glory. I give you my heart, and I thank you that you have given your life for me. From this moment on, I am yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. If you want further information, I've got a little something I'll just give you. Would you give us a call? Even though this program isn't on the air uh, in your area, well, the telephone number is still available. We're still on the, on the air 24 hours a day. It's 1-800-759-0700. I'll send this to you. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Praise the Lord. Tomorrow, we've got an exclusive video of a prostitution bust. The cops take you on a ride. That's Tuesday. You don't want to miss it. So for Wendy and all of us, and for Terry, who's here today, and thank God for them. We just appreciate you. And uh, if we can help you in any way, the numbers are there for you, so please call. Until then, for all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.